Hello, Melanie with Strategic Peace here and welcome back. We have a fantastic guest to introduce you to today as part of our series of interviews with Chief Revenue Officers. Steve Yesko is the CRO of Theorem Geo, which is a software firm with a robust consulting practice that augments their software business. They work with electric and gas utilities. Steve has a very wide ranging background, having started by studying accounting in college, then moving into an operations role, then into marketing, and now he is this overarching CRO at his company. Uh, in our interview, we talked about how Theorem had transitioned from a being a consulting practice into a software company that is augmented with consulting. We talked about how their sales and marketing has changed over the last year. And since I'm based in Houston and a lot of people who tune in are also based across Texas, we talked about the impact and the opportunity that was presented during the freeze and blackouts then in that happened this February, February of 2021. And we also talked about how Steve and Theorem work to bridge this understanding of the customer across all of their teams, whether that's sales and marketing or even the engineering and product teams. He shares some great tips here today, and I would love to know what are some of your key takeaways. So please leave us a comment below. Of course, we'd also love it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel and share the video with a colleague. This will help us get the word out about all of the great value that our guests are sharing. And with that, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you enjoy. You know, it's like reviewing your LinkedIn profile again. I was like, yes, I wanted to email, or I wanted to talk to you because most CROs seem to come from like a finance background or sales background. It's like, Steve's a marketer. So I was, uh, <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm now I'm going to bust your bubble a little bit. My undergraduate degrees in accounting. Okay. I actually started in accounting, went into operations, okay, then went into uh, product, then went into marketing, bunch of sales all through that, yeah, and then started shifting to as I started um, moving up in in roles and and focusing away from just operational and tactically get into more strategic. It yeah. started to encompass a lot more things. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've worn hats where I've run marketing organizations, I'm responsible for biz dev, product development, uh, all the sales functions. So it, it's kind of been a blend of all stuff. You, you know? Especially even starting with a degree in accounting and from your journey, I'm like, wow, you've just been in every part of a business. Yeah, except for legal, but I've read enough contracts right. and course of things that I could probably be a paralegal if I needed to. There you you know, without, without the paperwork, but yeah, but it's been crazy because I started in a fortune 100 company. I started with AT&T right. back when they were, you know, probably a fortune 10 company yeah. and everything is so specialized. You know, when you're in a company that's got 50,000 employees yes. and you know, you've got resources at your beck and call, you're the market leader. Um, but it gives you a real good foundation and grounding. And yeah. so I was there for probably 12 years, left and went to a VC driven telecom company, which was interesting. It was an interesting little pivot. Uh, we went through a series of acquisitions, ultimately became public and then left probably after about a 10 year stint. And after that, I've been really in a working with startups and entrepreneurially focused organizations. So I've kind of, you know, experienced both ends of the continuum, the yeah. good and the bad. You know, cause we do work with growing companies. So sometimes that startups, but a lot of times they're farther along, but you know, a couple hundred employees, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think sometimes when people have had a lot of big corporate experience and enterprise experience, they mm -hmm. like the idea of working at a smaller company or getting involved with the startup, but then the reality of it sets in and ends up, you know, there's no IT department when your email isn't working. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, did you find that? How did you find that transition? Painful at first. Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, what? I don't have somebody who can do this for me or where's, you know, it's good and it's bad. I mean, yeah. anybody who's gone through it, you realize on one hand, yeah, you were spoiled because, oh, I need somebody to go make me copies. I need somebody to make this presentation for me. I need, you know, this, that, and the other. Yeah. Um, that's the downside. But you, you learn to become um, very agile very quick, yes. which is what you need. 
the upside of it is you don't meet to debt, you know, and by the time you make a decision, the opportunity has passed you by. Yeah. You meet, you present the facts, make a decision and move from it. Yeah. And you pivot quickly. And you had to do that in any type of early stage startup, entrepreneurially envir oriented environment anyway. Yeah. And so that's, that's been refreshing, you know, so yeah. it's like everything. Yeah. So you're the CRO at Theorem Geo, but you right. were a CRO before that Correct. as well. So at what point did Theorem and their kind of company growth decide they needed a CRO? Theorem has been around for about 15 years. Right. One individual started it from his dining room table, you know, had an idea, had a vision, had right. passion, secured an engagement, and it kind of just started bubbling from there. So fast forward, you know, we're 15 years old now. We've got about 30 or so employees in four yeah. different locations. Um, still very entrepreneurially focused. We started out exclusively on the utilities industry, and specifically electric. Right. That's kind of morphed into electric and gas. And then from there, based on... Uh, a lot of the IP that we've developed, there's been interest, uh, folks that we know reaching out to us say, hey, this would be a great application in this vertical, this vertical. So okay. while utilities are still our core focus, uh, there's a lot of applicability across the board in some other sectors, uh, railways, uh, government entity, mm -hmm. construction, for example. Okay. Um, but in terms of, of my coming on board, I've been there for about two and a half years now. Um, it was a decision of the company to kind of move away from their strategic focus of just being a consulting company. Right. To one being a product company. We've got all this great IP. We've developed software applications that people are just, you know, they're just clamoring for it. And it, yeah. it, it's helping, you know, whether it's driving efficiencies whether it's uh, safety is a huge um, driver within the utility space, as right. it is, you know, your background in oil and gas, same thing. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our tools enhance safety, situational awareness, et cetera. And, and just, it's a heavily regulated environment. So there's a number of things there that we help uh, to augment uh, from a regulatory perspective as well. Sure. And, and so that growth was a decision to say, hey, We've got, a, we've got all this phenomenal IP and we've got some phenomenal stuff. We've got really wickedly smart people. Yeah. Let's take that, bottle it up, we're a well-kept secret and let's get the message out there. And, you know, as a result of that, so that was my coming on board yeah. and it's kind of just, you know, morphed from there. Um, CRO is, is a little bit of a misnomer. It's really, I think it was um, almost like a made up term. Sure. Uh, in the SaaS space, you know, for, oh yeah, you know, we're SaaS, let's come up with this unique name because SaaS companies are getting all these crazy multiples. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a combination. If you look at the definition, it's marketing, it's sales, it's business development, it's sales ops. Um, at the end of the day, uh, and I'll paraphrase my boss, and I've heard this before, you know, it's all about product, it's all about sales, and it's all about operations. And nothing happens until sales make something happen. Right. Right. And then everything else kind of drives from there. You've got a core product, but in terms of product supporting sales, and, and I'll say generically sales, um, no offense to the marketing folks. I've got a marketing background. You know, it's I'm just gonna roll it all in there together. Yeah. Something that's got to ring the cash register. Yep. So you're interacting, talking to customers, you're talking to prospects find out what's resonating, what's not resonating. And from there, that feedback goes back to the product team. Okay, yeah. here's what the market is telling us. Okay, great. Let's make those enhancements. Let's go back out there. And as we secure new clients, um, upsell existing clientele, yeah. operations. Because you know our job is not done at that point because you got the ops team has got to deliver it now. And they've got to make sure the customer is happy. In a SaaS environment, uh, especially in a B2B SaaS environment, depending on the verticals you're in and how far up market or down market you're going, it's month to month. Churn is a massive issue with, yeah. you know, with SaaS companies. Um, we're 
a little unique because we're playing in the enterprise space. So we're more of the traditional, um, you sign up for our services, you're gonna sign up for a term agreement. It's not gonna be month to month because this is not a B2B play that's uh, automated almost like a B2C play where people are going up on the web and signing up and this and that. Right. This is high touch. This is, you know, you have long sales cycles, three, four months up to a year and a half. Sure. You know, the, the only difference is with a cloud-based application, and some of our stuff is behind the firewall, but with cloud-based applications, you know, it's a lower um, total cost of ownership, yeah. lower, t, you know, TCO there. And there's some other advantages and flexibility um, that clients, you know, enjoy from that perspective. So we kind of leverage, you know, leverage that in terms of how we position our products, how we go to market with them and the benefits that we espouse to our clients and prospects. So was it a hard transition for the company to go from where it was almost all consulting to the software consulting mix? Because I know some companies struggle with that or like, well, the investors want to see more sales on the software side. And, it, you know, so how do you think think that well, in terms of the revenue proportions? Of well, you know, well, yeah, I mean, if we start with investors, the investors are, you know, investors, um, consulting companies uh, don't get them juiced up because right. the exit multiples aren't there, you know? Yeah. You're only as good as what revenue do you have under contract? That's it, right. you know? When you're on the product side, you have much higher margins. Yes. You know, you're not trading time for money. You have customers generally on some level of term agreement, you can accurately calculate churn, customer acquisition costs. You can forecast cash flows going forward. You can look at what your pipeline value is, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but in terms of consulting, yeah, for folks who've been, this is the be all end all, hey, it's consulting, that's all we've known. Yeah. That could be a challenge yeah. with any organization. It, you know, change is hard with anybody. Yeah. So yeah, there, you know, there were some hurdles we had to jump over as we're going through it and we continue to evolve from that perspective. Consulting is still a very significant part of our business and critical to a success going forward. Because, sure. you know, it, it's almost a symbiotic relationship. In some cases, myself, I'll get, I'll bring a new customer in, for example, on the software side. Well, you know, the old adage, land and expand with yeah. the client, right? So once we're in there, our consultants are in there working with them, implementing the existing products that they may have acquired. But through those interactions, they're now opened up and exposed to additional opportunities on the consulting side, right? or vice versa. They may be in working with a client on a consulting engagement and, hey, they see an opportunity where the client would benefit from one of the applications that we've developed. So, you know, it, it goes hand in hand. And so once the consulting side of the business saw that and, you know, could envision what the end game is and yeah. realize that there's benefits across the board for everybody, it was a win-win. The other thing is important to realize is too, um, and I made sure that, because I've seen it before and lived it before, that the consulting side of the business understand that in large part, they're the product development engine. They're right. in there seeing, okay, where are these pain points with customers? You know, how are things being done? Customer brought us in for engagement. Maybe it's a process improvement. Maybe it's the rollout something. Wait a minute. There, there's better ways to do things, or here's a persistent challenge we're seeing, not that's unique to this customer, but pervasive within the industry. Right. Okay. Let's go back and try to figure something out. And in effect, you get you've got a beta customer right there because you're working with somebody who who's in the industry and is experiencing that challenge, those pain points day to day. Right. Right. So you're in there. Okay. Hey. What about this? What if you did things differently? What if you had something like this? What would it do for you? Sure. You know, and so that's your R and D right there. Yeah. Back in and then you know, leverage that. Yeah. And I'm curious, kind of thinking that through. Um, I had a, I've had a few people that have struggled with this, but one in particular, and it was it was an interesting case. Their uh, sales sales and marketing team would get feedback on their product from a customer. And even though people on the product team had access to the CRM, you know, meeting notes where this was getting locked, that feedback was actually getting lost. Of course, then someone on their team, this was like one of the more ridiculous conversations I've ever had with someone over technology. They're like, 
well, I actually think the sales team should take notes on index cards and then we can share them once a month. And I was like, no, this is- Your head blew up. <laughs> this, no! Like, you know, I always tell people, I'm like, I don't even know how to talk to you. Cause like, I mean, I love index cards for certain things, but I'm like, I'm, I, you know, I'm normally trying to get people like, don't keep stuff in spreadsheets, like put it in software where you can access it and, and that kind of thing. So I'm curious at almost like a very like tactical level. How do you guys make, make that work? You probably would have screamed <laughs> if, well, when we turned the camera on, if you saw all these post-it notes behind me, right. You'd have been like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, it, it, it's funny. I um, bring our product team in on prospecting calls, not initial ones, but you know, after an initial conversation or two, we're doing a product demo, this, that, and the other. I bring our product team in and yeah. let them hear firsthand. And oh, by the way, um, have them act as um, you know, a sales engineer, so to speak. You know, we're still a relatively small organization. So we don't have, you know, hordes of sales engineers and sales folks out there to do it. You know yeah. what? You guys are responsible for development. Um, let me be the conduit so you can hear firsthand what customers are saying. You see what's going on in the market, but let's talk to the customers. And oh, by the way, I'll, I'll tee it up, but I want you to walk through when you're doing a demo, for example, yeah. what stuff does and yeah. hear it firsthand. You know, don't hear, you know, I'll provide you feedback, but you need to hear it firsthand. You need to experience it and then understand what kind of questions that a, a prospective customer is going to ask. What's right. their perspective? Because you always come out with some little new tidbit here and there. I like that too, because I think we have it, and I do this as well, a tendency to talk about, well, the customer facing teams, you know, thinking it's marketing sales support, service, success, whatever we want to lump that in as. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, accounting still deals with customers, <laughs> you know? And I think it's great for people that might have traditionally been a bit behind the scenes work with customers. It's like, you can't, there's no way to replicate hearing it directly from them and being on the call and having to look somebody in the eye live and say, you know, answer questions and see how it is that they're processed. Well, I, I'll tell you a quick story. My baptism years ago, uh, when I was a young lad, I was working for at and was in an ops role. I was uh, called in to, I won't say the name of the company, but it was another Fortune 100 company. It was a huge customer of theirs. And they were having some challenges with one of the products. And I had to go to a customer meeting and it was eye-opening because- yeah. You're siloed. You, you yeah. know, it's just, you never talk to customers. You never see what's going on. And to hear it firsthand, it was like, OMG, you know, wow. Um, catching some of the wrath of the customer was not too good, but, <laughs> it, it, you know, I think we all have battle scars there. But, you know, it was enlightening just to, you know, hear firsthand. And so from there, I've had some other opportunities before I've moved into pure sales and biz dev roles where you work with customers and whether you're in a product function, an ops function, whatever, and you hear firsthand what's going on. How are you using whatever we're providing to you? Yeah. Where are you having challenges with it? Tell us what you would like it to do that it's not doing. Yeah. You know, what should we be doing that we're not doing today? What should we do better? Yeah. And what should we stop doing that we're doing today? Yeah. You know, just a couple simple questions. Help yeah. us help you. And I think too, a lot of times when you've interacted with the customer directly, you get the idea of what it is that they're actually trying to do with your product or service. Yep. And then I, like I've had this a couple of times when you go back to developers, whether it's on a website or, or a software product, and it's like, well, they want to be able to do this. And sometimes if they're not interacting with customers, like that's stupid. I'm like, well, oh, yeah. before you pass judgment, <laughs> not all of our brains work the way yours does. <laughs> right. Number one. Number two, are you writing the check? Who's stroking the check right now? Right. They are, not you. So. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's a great example because, you know, you have requirements going off to IT organizations and it's like, let's bring them in, have conversations with the customers. Yes. Because you can gain a good understanding of really what, you know, the customer wants. Otherwise, it's, you know, that old, you know, you probably played the game when you're young where everybody 
whispers a secret to somebody, turn a line, okay, the last person, tell me what you heard. And it's nowhere near like what the yeah. first person said, right? Well, yeah. Unfortunately, in business, when you start rolling out products, oh, crap. Yeah. You know, if you're the one presenting it, whether you're ops or sales or sales ops presenting it to a client, you know, you're like, oh my God, what the hell is this? This is not what the customer wanted. Yes. And ITs or development shops like, yeah, that's that's what the requirements were. Or no, we changed it because that was really dumb. Yeah. This is a better way to do it. It goes back to the uh, index cards, right? Exactly. And I think internally it's easier to say, yeah, that's a stupid idea or, you know, that kind of thing. But you would never look, I, I can't imagine, look a client or a customer in the eye and be like, that's dumb. <laughs> and just be outright dismissive of it. Like, that's not... The answer you just gave me is yeah, not well, the answer. I yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, try that and let me know how that works out. All right. Yeah, exactly. So one thing I know, a, it's been a topic of conversation for a lot of people over the last year, which is kind of balancing the long-term strategy with the unknown short-term and being reactive. So whether that's COVID, but I think you know, I'm based in Houston, and so yeah. in February we you know, got to, well, luckily we didn't lose power, but we did lose water for several days, but almost everybody else I know lost power in the blackout. So did that impact you guys at all? Is that, a, is that a, actually an interesting use case for, for you of how you think about strategy versus reaction? Well, or? well it's strategically going to provide benefits because there are a lot of eyeballs on that right now. And you have this big multi trillion dollar infrastructure bill where, you know, billions of dollars are going to go in and people are saying, hey, we're, we're, when we talk about infrastructure, everything is driven by the power grid. And guess what? We are really vulnerable. It's in some areas, single threaded. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's pointing fingers. Okay. This is the problem. This is the problem. But at the end of the day, it's going to be opportunities for a lot of folks. Yeah. Who, who can innovate and can provide solutions that are going to resonate and, and the money will be there. Yeah. You know, so for us, absolutely. Short term, like everybody else. Yeah. I mean, you know, COVID was up, up just uh, getting hit in the face by Mike Tyson. You know, everything comes to a standstill. Um, we're all scrambling. Um, I've worked remote a lot. So for me, it was just like, yeah, I already have a home office set up, boom, boom, boom. For my wife, it was a little bit different. Obviously for uh, my youngest who was in school, you know, um, 180 degrees, but it poses a challenge that uh, everybody who's in B2B has been experiencing, which is, okay, how do I traditionally fill the top of the funnel? Yeah. How do I get my name out there? You know, a lot of folks are involved with trade shows, industry events, speaking engagements, dried up. Yeah. You now you're going from hundred miles an hour to zero instantly. Um, some of that is just starting to open up, but it's virtual at this point. Yeah. We've not participated as vendors in any virtual shows yet, because when I look at the ROI, it's not there. Right. Um, and, and in fact, you know, when you look at a, at a trade show, for example, it's usually six, nine months later before you can really ascertain what your ROI is. Yeah, I came back with a stack full of cards. Okay, how many of those were tire kickers versus really people that you're going to develop a meaningful relationship with? So, you know, it's six, nine months later. But what I've been seeing uh, right now is the price points are the same for virtual events first, and maybe people are just trying to make it up lost ground. And I just don't say it right now, you know? Yeah. Now, we're interacting with our prospects you know, through video conference like this, everybody's getting used to us, that works. Um, on the plus side, I don't miss having to get on a plane. Yeah. You know, the rigors of travel before COVID were, were challenging enough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, from that perspective, it's not bad. It's, it's nice, we're uh, not as open as Texas right now. We're in North Carolina, but we're opening up. We're back in the office two days a week. Yeah. As of about a month ago. So things are slowly starting to open up. So it's a nice, you know, blend. It was great. First day back in the office. Oh, this feels so good. Get to, you know, yeah. interact with people face to face. Head out and there's an accident on the interstate and there I'm stuck in traffic. 
Well, that, that, that honeymoon, you know, went away real quick. By then I was like, oh, this is something, you know, I didn't miss before. But anyway, um, yeah. it's all good. But yeah, it's, it's been a challenge. So it's like, how do we effectively look at our marketing spend? Yeah. What do we need to do? How do we reach customers? Customers are not in the office. Right. Right. And so, you know, cold calling, you're not going to get anybody. Right. right? Um, cold emails, you may get a response here and there, but it's a low response rate. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, tried and true tactics of, of leveraging referrals and networks um, from a biz deal perspective, sales is traditionally, you know, direct. Well, we're also leveraging indirect channels. So we'll okay. go out to select strategic partners. Uh, maybe they'd be referral partners, mm -hmm. you know, who have relationships, play like in our same sandbox, but we don't compete with one another. We're complementary. So we, there's not a risk of cannibalization either way. Right. And so that's, you know, you got to get creative. And, and I've built channels in the past before. So that was, for me, it's an easy pivot. Okay. Say, okay, hey, you know, it's not a be all end all. We're going to do some of these tactics, but let's, given the, the hand that everybody's been dealt with, play it out. When you can leverage channels where people have relationships already, they'll get phone calls returned. And so, you know, we start to do that and then build from there. Do you feel like you guys have ended up being more experimental with marketing and sales over the last year? Or do you feel like because there was more risk that you were more likely to stick to the tried and true? That is a great question. Um, <laughs> by and large, probably uh, contracted some because yeah. we've got to really be shepherds of how we're spending. Sure. and where we're spending and what we need to do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's great technology out there now from a MarTech perspective to help you track where people are in a uh, potential sales cycle, how you do touches, high touch, low touch to customers, et cetera. Yeah. But when it's all said and done, it's still about relationships, interpersonal skills, having conversations, picking the phone up. You know, there's a lot of times I have clients or prospects who prefer phone calls. They prefer, some prefer emails, some prefer texting. Okay, great. But you got to recognize it, it's all of those. Um, I've seen folks who just want to rely on email or just texting. Pick the phone up, talk to somebody, Yeah. you know, but yeah. it, it's a blend of all that. Have you guys added any technology over the last year or what does your tech stack look like? Anything um, you live without? Uh, slim to none, maybe. No, it's, um, you know, at the heart of it is um, CRM. And then you've got some marketing automation functions that uh, go off of that. Um, we have a roadmap of stuff that we'll be adding from a technology perspective, but where we are as a company and probably more important where the market is right now, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, we're coming out of this real dark period with COVID that impacted everybody. And until I think we get back to the quote unquote new normal where it's close to business as usual, some of that stuff um, doesn't make sense for us to move forward with. But it's, but it's things on there where we're going to start turning up the marketing engine in several areas, things where then I can leverage technology from a web perspective okay. to do, you know, uh, you know chat, bots, uh, a lot of analytics, a lot of, of neat technology that I've seen to be able to interact, to track um, visitors potentially come to your site. Yeah from a digital perspective. CRM you talked about earlier, that's a great yeah. example. The way CRMs now are set up, it, it covers the entire customer life cycle, but it also covers all of the different touch points within an organization. You yeah. I mentioned earlier for us, it's, I'm gonna simplify things. It, it's product sales and operations. Yeah. Everybody has visibility into what's going on in there. Yeah. So, you integrate your marketing activities. We can see what's happening. We can see where people are, our prospects are within a funnel perspective. Yeah. We can see where our existing customers are or new customers. 
we yeah. can go in there and see all of the different touch points that are going on, yeah. right? And then start driving all those analytics. So it's an existing customer. Okay, let me see what kind of interactions there have been. Have there been phone calls from a tech support perspective? Are they reaching out to our ops folks? Are they reaching out to our billing folks? What's, you know, what's going on there? Yeah. And then you have account relationship managers, you have consultants touching it as well. So let's say from a holistic perspective, What's happening? I started using HubSpot in 2012, back before it was CRM. Like it was just right. automation. We had a separate CRM tool. It's amazing to me now. And you know, we're a HubSpot partner. And I'm like, yeah. the fact that you can pull in the marketing sales support all in one place and like, and have one database. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, this would have been so nice <laughs> 10 years ago or you know, however long, but right. um, no matter what database you pick, the fact that everyone has access to it and you can pull in all of the touch points is just amazing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you get, you know, a 360 view of the customer. You can see what's going on. Yeah. Um, just like anything else, the, the key there is you got to be disciplined. Oh, yeah. You know, are people using it? Yes. Are they inputting the data? And then are you mining the data? Yeah. You need both parts of it. I know we've had like a comp like a couple of people that we've talked to and they're like, well, what does HubSpot do for me? How am I, get, how do I get new customers through HubSpot? I'm like, well, it's a tool. <laughs> like, you know, you have to use the tool. It's yep. not a robot. <laughs> Parts of it are, but still have to set it up. So I'm curious, so you've done telecom and you, you're in the utility space now. So you've done a lot of different things. How much of your job do you feel like is really, you're able to do it well because you have functional expertise versus more industry expertise. Do you feel like I can go drop you in any industry right now? And you'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I can go be CR. Uh, well, not quite. I mean, everybody's <laughs> got, you know, um, their own set of acronyms. Yeah. And you have certain baseline functional skills that port across any industry. So from my perspective, when we're talking at the beginning, um, I have an accounting and financial background, at least from an undergraduate perspective. Works yeah. out great because I can read a PL statement. I can build yeah. a business case, or I can, if somebody presents it to me, I can take it apart and ask very relevant, pertinent questions, understand real quick if somebody is quote unquote, you know, blowing smoke at me versus is there something really there, as an example. And then just all of the other composite skills. The, the chat, it's a, Long-winded way to say, yes, you could parachute into another industry, but there always is a learning curve, but the learning curve will be much shorter yeah. because I just need to understand what is unique about the industry, jargon, vernacular, are there any unique characteristics, the way companies operate, the way they view things, what are their challenges, et cetera. Yeah. But I mean, when it's all said and done, it's all, you know, customers either you know, they're looking to, how do I get more customers? How do I get those customers to spend more money? Or how do I do things more efficiently? How can I reduce my operating expenses? Or how do I protect myself from a legal and regulatory exposure perspective? Right. You know, generally, it's one of those things that are at the heart of a, of a challenge that a customer has where you can go in there and provide something of value to them. Um, it's just unique circumstances, you know, industry by industry. So if you were to drop me into construction industry, you know, uh, initially uh, everyone would be speaking Greek to me probably or vice versa. But, you know, once you learn that and there'll be some unique nuances, um, the basics of business are going to be the same. Yeah. I feel like healthcare is just a bit of a different beast generally because of how regulated it is and yep. nuanced it is. And then it gets very scientific very fast as well. Yeah, I think, well, it, it's funny because uh, in the utility space, they're extremely heavy, re heavily regulated. Yes. Telecom aspects of it are, are heavily regulated and other aspects are the wild, wild west. Same with um, yeah. energy. I mean, that's what's going on with um, ERCOT, the failure in Texas. And you've heard these stories of folks getting 10, $15,000 bills. You know, and it's like, oh, deregulation wasn't so good, was it? Well, if you I had back, <laughs> yeah, if you had backup plans for it and uh, failover capability, then yeah. you, know, you would obviate a lot of those things. So, what are some of your favorite resources 
that you're like, I'm going to go keep up to date. I mean, my husband was an engineer, so he's got, you know, certain technical publications he goes to. I have certain podcasts I like on the sales and marketing front. What do you? A a number of those things. There are certain um, industry rags I'll go to. One, just to have industry expertise, what's going on. Um, Two, from a, you know, marketing sales biz dev perspective, what's the new technology out there? Are there any new techniques that are out there? What seems to be working as things have changed? COVID was a great example. Okay, what's working? Yeah. What's not working? How do we pivot? How do we leverage the opportunity that really is an opportunity with this challenge? Yes. Just stuff like that. And then really leveraging your network. Mm-hmm. You know, having a, a core group around you um, that you can reach out to to bounce ideas off of. And, and certainly with things like LinkedIn, it's really helped take that, you know, what I call like a, a core inner circle and be able to really blow that up. Yeah. Hey, you know, reach out to so-and-so or so-and-so. Have you had this challenge before? What have you done? What do you think about this? Right. And so, you know, using that as a sounding board. So equally important to me is not only having industry expertise and knowledge and specific um, functional expertise, that sounds great, but I want real world expertise as well. Okay, some of this stuff is all theoretical and you know, there's a lot of gurus out there who push a lot of information that I've never done what they're saying they're doing. Yeah. You know, they're, they're there, all they're doing is pushing out whatever programs they want to sell. Yeah, they've never done it, you know, so it's, it's okay, let's take a look at this stuff. And let me talk to some folks who are out there like me, sleeves rolled up, you're out there, you're grinding it, you're building businesses and driving and accreting value with those businesses. What's working? Yeah, it's not working. We ran into last year, actually, it was around the election, um, yeah. where some of our online ads and stuff for clients didn't perform as I would have expected. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was COVID on top of the elections on, you know, it was yeah. like, we had, I feel like just multipliers over the last year. And so, you know, people would go, well, what's the benchmark for this? Or, you know, well, what's right. happening? And it's like, well, you know, the latest articles are for some of these where you get really specific stuff. The last specific figure I can find for your specific question is from two years ago. So it's completely irrelevant. I mean, not totally irrelevant, but you know, I can't use that as a base. And so I have to, uh, I think having conversations with other people who are literally doing the exact same things and going, okay, so are you seeing the same thing? Are you seeing the same thing? Yep. Okay. So now we can start to piece together what's actually going on. Exactly. So, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything surprising about what you do? Not really. No. Yeah. You, know, you know, you were hoping for a nugget there. <laughs> No, no. COVID has presented a challenge like like everybody. We've been blessed in that our target verticals, utility industry, are there day in and day out. Now, they've had challenges, obviously. Their revenues have gone down because industrial customers and business customer revenue took nosedives. You've got residential customers who uh, they've got large accounts receivable balances now because they couldn't shut power off or do not pay. So now they've got issues with collections. But You know what? If we were in the uh, hospitality and restaurant business providing supplies to restaurants, it's been a different story. Yeah. You know, so um, from that perspective, we've been blessed. Yes. Um, And it's just, hey, you know, make hay out of it. What do what do what's there? Everybody, business is still running, albeit maybe not as uh, fast right now. Yeah. And We've got to figure out ways to reach out and to be able to get our message in front of somebody to be able to connect with the folks that it's going to resonate with. Yeah. Both the decision makers, as well as the folks who are really um, day to day dealing with these issues and challenges and the ones who are really going to embrace our solution, you know, and there's no right or wrong way to do it. There's no one silver bullet to do it. You know, I, I wish there was, but there's not. I know. I think you know? everyone keeps looking for the silver bullet. If anyone ever finds it, it's going to be like the holy grail. 
yeah, yeah, exactly. You get a lot of people who chase that shiny penny, but you know, bring your lunchbox, so to speak, every day. Yeah. And you go through it, especially, you know, you've been um, and your husband have been in larger organizations. You now have your own consulting firm. So, you know, firsthand, you've got to, you know, you pivot, you try different things. It works, but you continually test stuff. Yeah. The key is you test stuff and you do it in a way that limits your exposure, limits, yeah. limits your downside, right? Yeah. Not everything's going to work, but hey, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. And I think there too, you have to uh, keep in mind being disciplined about the testing. So it can't be, yeah, all right, I'm going to test this and then, but kind of halfway do it and then draw conclusions <laughs> from that. And then the other is, I think sometimes it's, you have to have the patience to do yeah. it. it. Sometimes those tests don't mean, well, you're testing it for a day and then you know. <laughs> yeah, um, trust me, I've, I, you know, I had that experience. You run um, social media ads are a great example. Yeah. Oh, I expect this result. No, it was in the results were in the toilet. Well, what happened? Let's tweak this. That is, you know, you got to see things through, but also recognize as I said, you got to control the downside. And at some point you got to realize, hey, this is just not working. Let's cut bait. Yeah. We Absolutely. tried this. It didn't work. Let's move on. And so if people want to connect with you, LinkedIn? LinkedIn, absolutely. Awesome. All right. Great. Well, we'll add the link and right. a link to Theorem Geo. And thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate it too. And um, we'll be in touch.